armies draw near, and to my prayer incline, in arts gymnastic, and in fraud divine. Dire weapon of the tongue which men revere, be present, Hermes, in thy suppliant here. Welcome to Third Eye Bind, episode 41, Sex Magic. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Caitlin. And welcome back to Third Eye Bind. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is season five. five. I'm taking off my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the season five premiere. Five, epi- five episodes. Five, five whole season. episodes. Five whole, five whole episodes. Episodes. seasons. One and episode a season. I think this is like episode 50? It's like 40. Oh, you're right. 40, because it's, yeah, you're right. Because I remember when it's I. It's the 10 back. Yeah. 40, we this start. is 41. 41. <gasps> if this were a TV show, we would be like almost halfway syndicated. <laughs> we would be, we would be wrapping up our whole storyline arc. I know. That's wild. I just, what would happen? Wow. I don't know. I don't know. Well, per usual, we have some fun things to ask of you, um, like liking us. Please like us. <laughs> Please subscribe. Please rate us. Mm-hmm. And if you'd like to join our Patreon, we have that, patreon.com slash third eye bind. You can get a sticker pack. You can get early access. There's a plethora of opportunities to uh, assist us in our magical creations yes please help us keep our independent podcast running um we do love your praise and your reviews but tbh we'd also like a little bit of your money because it costs a lot to keep this thing going it does it does (laughs) so yeah and happy one year anniversary. Happy anniversary to Third Eye Bind. Mm. Uh, July 17th was our first, 2022 was My our first pants. air date. <laughs> yes. Caitlin's wearing loud pants. Sorry, today. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> or you're welcome. It's ASMR. You're welcome. <laughs> Pant ASMR moment. Go for it. For patrons. Like a cricket, <laughs> like a sexy cricket. <laughs> Which is appropriate because today we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. And you might be wondering, what are we getting into? Why is there a third chair here? What's happening? What the hell is going on? Caitlin, Laura, we're confused. But I want to say what the f- is going on because we have that fun little noise you just heard now. So I'm going to say f- more often. <laughs> just for the f- of it. <laughs> We have our first in-person guest today, a lovely human by the name of Halen Belay, and I'm going to read her bio from my cell phone right now. Halen Belay is a sexual health expert, body worker, and pleasure witch based in Baltimore, Maryland. With over a decade of experience in trauma-informed health education, her expertise is in holistic mind-body-spirit approaches to social-emotional development and using witchcraft to promote psychosocial wellness. Mm. Very cool. Mm. And what are we talking about today, Caitlin? Today we are talking about sex and pleasure magic. Sex and pleasure magic. Yeah. Let's get into it. But be- we have to conjure our guest really oh, quickly. Right. Oh, let's manifest her. One, <laughs> two, three. Oh, wow. Oh, Hi. it works. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Haylin. Welcome to our Thank set. Thank you for having me. Let's clap. Oh, oh wow. Oh, audience wow. applause. Thank you to the studio audience. <laughs> Welcome to our set. Thank you. Thank you for ha- thank- Well, thank you for bringing me. To your set. Yeah. Um, it How was, was really it? Short. It was short. It was short and easy. Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. I Good. would say oh, immediate. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I love it. Based on our topic today, we hope that's not how it goes, right? Hello. Hey, oh, there's going to be a lot of that today because wow. okay. I'm a five-year-old boy. That's okay. But we love that about you, Laura. Here's Thank you. Thing. I'm immature in a fun way. So before we get into our conversation with our incredible guest about sex and pleasure magic, we're going to do what we always do and pull a card from the Sirens of Song tarot deck. Available on LadyMoon.co. Ooh, that's it. Okay. It's literally my phone background. I'm a, oh, I'm a stan. So I'm a true stan. Thank you. Okay, what's going to be? Uh, what is it? What? What is it? 
It's the Two of Swords. Again? Which is interesting because this card has been coming up a lot this season. Pause. So what's up? Last season. I mean, last season. season. Oh my God, this is a new season, season. LOL. No, it's it's been coming up. A stalker. This card is stalking us because, like, okay, when we arrive at the Two of Swords, we are at this crossroads where we are too afraid or uncomfortable Uh. to take steps forward into the unknown, hence the blindfold. We can't really see or maybe don't want to see what's going on around us. And I think that, Mm -hmm. especially in this Western world where everything is based on white supremacist, puritanical culture, there is this incredible discomfort and disconnection from pleasure and sexuality and this fear of it, this villainization of it. So it actually makes a lot of sense that for this conversation, there's this reflection through the tarot of how so many of us have been conditioned to feel and see sexuality and pleasure when the reality is like the flowing water behind the figure in the Smith weight deck. It is something that is a part of us. It is something like pleasure is our birth right and it is reflected to us in every single part of nature it's late spring right now it's summer officially summer solstice has hit and the plants are all f***ing and there are my doves are laying the doves are laying eggs and we see it everywhere around Mm -hmm. us and like even like the way birds sing to one another to mate like just all of it we see this like beauty that is so deeply intertwined when it comes to pleasure and sex to have to deny that of ourselves Mm -hmm. is is uncomfortable but i am so 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 excited to have you here to help us take off that blindfold and put those swords of protection down so that we can like open up our hearts and open up our bodies and our minds to the idea that like we can get comfortable with right. this type of um, magic, but really like spirituality and like mm-hmm. existence, mm-hmm. like existence on the garden planet, on planet Earth. And I think that's really fucking cool. So that's that's two the card, and what I love it for us. What do you think about the two of swords? Yes, yeah, tell mean, us. So when I when I talk about the two of swords with like clients or students, mm-hmm. a lot of times we'll talk about this nature of like swords as the realm of our thoughts and our intellect and our ideas Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right or wrong and that two of swords being representative of like a binary but almost always with a few exceptions it's coming up as a reminder that that binary is not real Mm. right like to your point right that this is a binary that exists because we are in some way blindfolded and it's in a recognition that when we're operating from this rational perspective that we've been taught to sort of privilege and think of as being the most legitimate the most correct Mm. the most uh real you are giving something up like you are you are blinding yourself to something if you're going into something from an objective perspective you're saying i'm going to take this type of information this category of wisdom out of the equation there are situations in which that's useful, right? Like every card in the tarot has a... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Amateur hour. Um, every card in the deck has some utility to it, right? Mm. But the... Uh, there's always a spectrum. There's yeah. a spectrum. But I think to your point, especially when it comes to the work that I do, you know, the, the manifesto on my website says, all people deserve an integrated life and the healthy pursuit of pleasure. Mm. And everything that I do is around trying to help make that more possible for people. Mm. And a lot of what that looks like is helping people to see where um, right and wrong and like black and white thinking have maybe seeped into areas of their life that's not appropriate for it to be in. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to questions of like pleasure and self-intimacy and especially intimacy with other people and vulnerability, that's not really a place where that kind of like right and wrong black and white thinking is going to help you because your subjective wisdom is actually the most important and the most useful in those circumstances, mm, right? We have okay. to rely on yeah. like our, our human animal body to be able to like take care of us in that way because that's literally what they evolved to do. Mm. Yeah. Ah. Denying that seems unnatural. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, it's why it's why that like sexual repression uptightness is also so associated with like 
violence, quite frankly, yes. that there is something really, I, I mean, I don't want to invoke human nature too aggressively here, but there is something very inhumane about trying to deny or control or restrict mm-hmm. um, that really like fundamental, I mean, there's a reason why I call myself a pleasure witch, right? Like pleasure is really at the heart of my witchy practice because coming to identify as a witch for me started with being like, okay, I have something that I know to be true Mm -hmm. and everyone's telling me I'm wrong. So I can either say like, yes, you're right. I'm wrong. And I'm going to kill that thing inside me. Or I can say like, yes, you're right. I'm wrong. And I love being wrong. Like I think being Mm -hmm. wrong is so, if that's what right is, I love being wrong. And live deliciously. Literally that was (laughs) like, you know, (laughs) there was like a, a little senior profile in my college paper, my senior year. And in it, I would talk about like, yeah, I'm embracing self-identifying as a slut. Like I'm embracing self-identifying as like things that, you know, I, I put witch yeah. on my business card yeah. mm-hmm. and I had several very well-meaning people. This was in like 2015. So many well-meaning people be like, hey, are you sure that you want to do that? Like, that's really <laughs> like you're, you know, you're, you're keeping yourself out of certain rooms by making that choice. And mm. I was like, exactly. I am keeping myself out of certain rooms by yeah. making that choice. Mm-hmm. I'm keeping myself safe from being in certain rooms by making the choice to say, like, I'm going to lead with the thing that I know to be true, which is, like, my human animal body feels things. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to live in denial of the things that I'm feeling. I want to live in harmony with that mm-hmm. wisdom, you know? Tell us a little bit more about how you came to be a pleasure witch. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's two answers, right? Which I think is true for a lot of like contemporary Mm -hmm. witches. There's the period of adulthood where I started like to choose to identify as a witch, which for me was around, like I said, like the end of college Mm -hmm. is when I was really like, okay, I'm personally and professionally and in all ways, like really embracing this as a way of life. But then there's also the deeper answer of, you know, growing up, there was so Mm -hmm. much symbol and ritual and meaning in everything that my uh that my mom did my mom raised me as a single parent Mm -hmm. and um she was an immigrant from Ethiopia and was like I mean very recently immigrated as in I was conceived in Ethiopia and then was born in the United States (laughs) yeah so she was still very proximate to that culture and raised me as being very proximate to that culture And so much of that culture involves like symbolic gesture and meaningful Mm -hmm. ritual really embedded into day-to-day life. Like the way that you greet people, Mm -hmm. um, the way that you feed people, there's, there's a way of feeding people that is like, I mean, I think of it as like a little spell every time I do it where it's, you're literally feeding somebody from your hand into their mouth. Mm. And I can't, (laughs) sorry. Sorry. It, this what? Is, you this do it with family. Nice. It's like, it's intimate. But, but yeah. that's an intimate way to like right. eat and consume. Like that's really cool. It's I can think of very few other, like what's a more fundamental way that we as human beings can say to somebody like, I care about you than yeah. like, I'm literally, in ner- I'm going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> like that's such a like powerful um, concept to have like been lucky enough to have been exposed to as a child. Yeah. And like, really having a relationship to the idea that like my mom would put her hand on my belly when I had a stomach ache and my stomach would go away. Yeah. I don't know how that works. You know what I mean? There's okay. Mm -hmm. There's like the, whatever scientific explanation of, you know, pressure stimulation Mm -hmm. and, you know, psychosomatic, whatever, whatever, but also that's magic. It is magic. magic. And I think science is just, is very often like, Mm. Uh, Western society validating or yes. qualifying yes. what we already know right. in indigenous cultures. Yeah. Which can be useful. Yeah, which, right. But it's the over-reliance on, mm-hmm. like, if it's not provable and write downable, then it's not real. Then it's not real. Exactly. Yeah. Until wild. they decide it's real, yeah. it's not real. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of crazy because it's like, but you you feel it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you feel it's So how can you say it's not real? Mm-hmm. I also think um, bringing up feeding someone, your family members, is a really beautiful practice because I think so much of what folks consider to be pleasure-based, they they have a hard time divorcing it from like sex and sensuality and pleasure can be so much more than Mm -hmm. that. Um, Talk to us a little bit about your relationship to pleasure and how 
I don't know. You talk to like your – you do so many amazing things. You teach yeah. sex ed. <laughs> you see clients one-on-one. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about like your manifesto and your mission when it comes to pleasure. Yeah. So my career is like a sexuality expert, sex ed teacher, started in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in – That's cool. Yeah. I was in Texas, um, which is oh, an wow. abstinence-only state. Oh, yeah. fun. And so I was in like a sex ed class where I'm being told like, you know – girls don't get horny and like a healthy family is a mother and a father and like just (gasps) things that again even as a teenager I was like this is bullshit like there's no way this is this is the truth that you're telling me Mr. Football Coach who's teaching my sex ed class I refuse to believe the football coach at my high school taught my sex ed class too I don't even whose daughter got pregnant when she was 14 LMAO so he was bitter right I went to Catholic school, so we didn't have sex ed. We got to watch an abortion video and a birth oh, video. Fun. And we were allowed to opt out of it. And they were made as it. traumatizing as possible, Absolutely. I'm sure. Yeah. I opted out. Yeah. I, was I mean, like, that's... I don't... <laughs> I don't need to watch that. That's so many people's experience. Marty fucking. Like, right. I don't need to... <laughs> well, and that's the thing that, you know, I think for a lot of people, especially people in our age cohort, I can only speak to, like, the American context. That's the one that I'm in. Right, yes. And in the United States, like, when I ask rooms of adults who here had not even good sex education, any Any. sex education, Mm. it's usually less than 50% of people who are raising their hands. And then when I ask the question, like, did you talk about anything beyond condoms on bananas? Like, did you talk about, like the reasons why someone would want to have sex as opposed to all the reasons why you're supposed to say no to sex. And that usually drops down to close to zero. Um, Abs- yeah. Because we, we, this association that you're talking about, right, of pleasure is always sexual and sexual is always profane and dirty. Mm. You yeah. know, then people have this weird uh, sort of uptightness about talking to young people about pleasure. Yes. As if young people don't already have a relationship to their own bodies. Like right. as if they're somehow, you know, if we don't tell them that sex exists, they're not going to have They're not going to know. Feet. They just won't know they it's just there. Won't, no, they won't yeah. find out. And in the age of the internet, that's especially ridiculous oh, yeah. Yeah. as a perspective and as a, a place to be. Um but that was a thing that I ran into as a sex educator a lot was like mm. parents, teachers, administrators who were like, "Okay, can you teach a sex ed class but like not talk about orgasm?" Which is like what? No, <laughs> no, I can't. Like that's that's why do you want me to do that? Why do you? Why is that to you what a good sex education is? And like, what about like why is that the line of profanity? Right. Like where profanity lies, orgasm. Because yeah, that's it's so the weird. most pleasurable moment. Yeah, because yeah. they don't want people to want to have sex. It's just so bonkers. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, like orgasm in particular to me is like. It's like a reset button, mm. but it's also like the the I don't know like it's 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 some there's something about because I have some like I have some sexual trauma it's fine oh I'm but sorry but like are you a woman in America yeah, right I mean it's, you have we some all, form we all of got something trauma? right yeah but what I'm trying to get at is like there's a level of like denying myself that pleasure mm-hmm. that I think mm. stems from not being educated about 100% orgasm in other than like it's a thing that hopefully happens right when you have heterosexual sex yeah yeah sometimes like I don't know it just it's such a it was and I think it that's trickled over a little bit to where it's like yeah, like denying, like being being unable to be completely intimate with sex right. and pl- and orgasm and pleasure because it's like a form of like self punishment in a weird way. Like totally. I don't, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. It's very complex, but like I I'm sure I'm not the only. Surely I'm not the only person that no. feels. Yeah. that I mean, way. like I just said, I I was in a sex ed class yeah. where I was being told girls don't get horny. So what does that mean yeah. for me as a girl sitting in this class being like? I've been horny. So yeah. does that mean that I'm there's something, something wrong, wrong with me? Mm-hmm. And there's so much focus, I think, uh, put on teaching, especially in this heterosexual, like heteronormative framework, yeah. right? Yeah. Teaching girls how to say no and not on teaching girls why they might want to say yes and how like it how they can say mm-hmm. yes and know yeah. what yes feels like for them. Yeah. Which yeah. is, you know, I think it people have this distorted um perception sometimes, not always, 
But something I ran into in my career is this distorted perception that the girls who are most at risk are the girls who are not interested in sex. And that's not true. It's the girls who are, are interested in sex right. and are not being equipped with any of the any tools, tools to do it safely and are mm. being told that because you want to do this, there's something wrong with you. Mm. Well, then, okay, so if I have bad experiences in the world, it's that much it's easier for me to blame now. myself. Exactly. Like, it's so much easier for me to say, yeah. this is because I there's something wrong with me. Oh, my God. Wow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So to go back yeah. to that... <laughs> To go Whoa. back to your question of like <laughs> how to, how I became a pleasure witch, it was things like this, right? It was being in these circumstances where I'm being told something and I'm being told not just by my health teacher, but also by TV and movies and family and church and everything. everything. Media, I'm yeah. being told that this is the way things are. And I'm thinking like, no, they're not. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. That really took me from... Yeah, like I said, from high school, like from basically as early as I was able to like knit my brain together enough to have opinions. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, OK, so the opinion that I have is like, fuck this. Like the, yeah. opinion, the opinion that I have is I want to organize my life around, again, the thing that I know to be true. So um, I started my, you know, I guess, career as a sex educator, as a peer health educator, um, mm. because I went to like a youth activism camp. Uh, for the, I was the president of my high school GSA. Yes. Uh, you know? Um, Amazing. Our high school, the first year we ever had a GSA was my year. We like started yeah. the GSA. And I think it was the only one in our entire archdiocese. <laughs> the archdiocese. I would believe it. Yeah. I would believe it. Yeah. <laughs> So and cool. yeah, being the, you know, being involved with the GSA and being involved with this youth activism program, one of the things that they talked about was, you know, again, being in Texas in particular, mm-hmm. queer inclusive sex. The first queer inclusive, like pleasure based sex ed class I ever had was at this youth activism summer camp that I went to. And it was like this person who at the time I was like, wow, you're like so grown up. And now I'm like, you were like 23. And like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just yeah. like a grad student who was, you know. I mean, again, to me, at, you know, 15, 16 years old, I was like, you're the coolest person I've ever met. Because he was teaching me about things that, like, as I'm sitting in this workshop, I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. have adults known this the whole time and, like, chosen Mm. not to tell me? That's crazy. Like, this information exists and the adults in my life are... relevant to you? And the adults in my life are keeping it from me. That's crazy. So becoming... um, Becoming plugged into, like, not just sex education is important because, like, sex positivity, but specifically coming at that from a political perspective Mm -hmm. and from a social justice framework. I feel very lucky for that. Um, There are a lot of sexuality educators who don't have that Mm -hmm. as, like, a core tenant to um, what they're doing. Or if it is something that they value, it's not always the case that they have the opportunity to actually get training in that framework and in that perspective. Mm. Um, So I feel very lucky that I was brought up not just in peer education programs, but specifically peer education programs that were really on like the cutting edge of best practices for how to like think about and teach, yeah, sex education. So I was doing this work as a sex educator. You know, I went to college. I'm like doing my little, I'm doing my little thing. Mm -hmm. And I think I made it all the way to like maybe a year out from graduation before I realized like, wait a minute, sex ed is a thing that I can do like full time. Like yeah. this is the thing that I can do and that I can do really well. well yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Absolutely. after a while started to do independently because I was, you know, running into the problem of like, oh, I am really values led in my work. And that means that when I work for somebody, I'm inevitably having some really Mm-hmm. unpleasant conversations mm-hmm. with that somebody yep. you know inevitably yep. having some um mm. some you become the problem yes uh-huh <laughs> and so making that choice to like go independent go mm-hmm. freelance um I still remember the tarot reading that I did that like I was like okay I have to quit my job um hotel it was <laughs> so it was like a little kind of like this or that it was like a branching you can mm-hmm. do you have two options and on the one side was like you can follow your motivation towards financial security Mm. and end up dead inside. Mm -hmm. Or you can follow like the thing that you know to be true Mm -hmm. and end up um, broke. And that was the option that I was given. And Mm -hmm. seeing it framed that way was like, oh, I know what it's like to be broke. I know I can survive being broke. Like that scares me way less than Mm -hmm. being dead inside because I also know what it feels like to be dead inside. And I can't survive that. No. Like, that's actually an intolerable position for me, physiologically, emotionally, spiritually. It's like Mm. in every possible way. Um, I would rather be broke. Yeah. As unpleasant as being broke is, I would rather be broke. Mm -hmm. So 
that uh, that was really the beginning of, I think, starting to knit together, not just, oh, I'm a sex educator, oh, I'm a you know youth activist, I'm a peer educator, whatever, but starting to really think of this as like, no, this isn't just about like, you know, what I'm professionally interested in or what I have expertise in or, you know, how I want to show up in the world in this mm-hmm. really, um, I think, yeah, capitalistic way, mm-hmm. right? What do I do? And turned into like, this is actually about I was actually just at a conference a couple of days ago where one of the speakers was talking about like, it's not about work-life balance, it's about work-life integration mm-hmm. and not having to have your work be something that is so separate from your life that you feel like your life ends when you clock into work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, being able to say, um, I want my work to reflect like, you know, the life that I want to live, the life that I want to mm-hmm. support other people in living. That was how I got, <laughs> got all the way around to mm-hmm. I'm a pleasure witch because you know, doing some internal investigation and asking myself, what is it really that I believe? Mm. That's what I came up with is all people deserve an integrated life and the healthy pursuit of pleasure. Like that's the thing that I, I'm going to get catch up talk about. It feels like destiny. I'm so horny. Oh my God. <laughs> it is really like, it's the, th- mm-hmm. it's the thing that I've felt like, I feel so lucky. I feel like that's not a thing that a lot of people get to experience, yeah. especially at such a young age to feel like, oh, I, this is it. Like, this is my thing. And there's a lot of other areas of my life where I've had a lot less confidence and a lot more struggle. But when it comes to like, what am I here to do? That like page of pentacles question. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Uh, I'm, I know that I'm here to, you know, to do this, to help people live more pleasurable lives and to the healthy pursuit of pleasure. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like a very intentional Mm. phrasing. Right. Um, you're making that distinction between, pleasure and what feels good right um, because they're, they're not, not always the gonna same. Ask you about they're that. not the mm-hmm. same yeah right. the way that I define it in uh, like classes that I teach or when I'm working with people is I usually give them the framework because this is, comes from my work as a social emotional skills teacher mm-hmm. um of okay you take any coping skill that you use make a big list and then sort them into what's self-care which is I may or may not enjoy doing it while it happens but it's setting up my body and my environment for the conditions that are facilitating pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. Drinking Mm -hmm. water may or may not be pleasant when I'm doing it, but it's working hydrated. Exactly. These things that are good for us, but may or may not be in the moment enjoyable. Fun, right. Right. (laughs) Like I'm not eating a bag of chips, I'm running. (laughs) And then we have self-indulgence, right? Which is things that do feel good in the moment, um, but that may or may not be conducive to the conditions of pleasure. Mm -hmm. So things like, yeah, the bag of chips, the pint of ice cream, I am very pro the bag of chips and the pint of ice cream, but I also can recognize like (laughs) I had a a day in uh, college where I ate an entire like half gallon container of mint chocolate chip ice cream and that was the only thing that I ate for the whole day. Right. That was not pleasurable. Like that wasn't something that I was doing because I was like, I really want to indulge in how much I love mint chocolate chip ice cream and like feel really good. It was like how like how much ice cream will it take for me to like not feel the thing that I'm feeling inside. And so, again, making that distinction that self-indulgence is things that can feel good but need to be thought of very intentionally. Mm. And then that last category of self-sabotage, so the things that feel good while you're doing them and do not set up the conditions for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I think Mm. that's the place where people often get tripped up uh, when thinking about, you know, I want to make pleasure the center of my life, right? Mm -hmm. People hear me say that and they're like, I want to do that too. Yeah. But if your idea of pleasure, I mean, no, it sounds great and it Mm -hmm. is great, but I think what people don't- (laughs) Slow down their Dionysus. I was just going to say like, (laughs) sexy Dionysus party orgy. Well, well, so here's the, here's the good news and the bad news. In moderation. In moderation. (laughs) Yeah. I think a lot of what it is to make pleasure the center of your life is also to rehabilitate your relationship to pain, to be honest. Like, I think that's Mm. been the biggest part of what being a pleasure, which has been for me is not not just like doing things that make me feel good, but mm-hmm. also, I mean, yeah. So on a physiological level, I could nerd out about this for so long. So please do. Please stop this me. Here. <laughs> on a physiological level, we like when you feel pleasure, it's mm-hmm. not because of mechanically what's happening to your body or what you're doing. It's because of how you are perceiving it. Mm-hmm. Um, none of us have ever perceived reality. We all live in the matrix. Mm-hmm. Like our brains are coming up with a simulation based on, you know, their best information to help us survive and to navigate the Mm -hmm. world. And so that's the reason why, you know, the same stimulation when you're horny and turned on can feel really good or feel really bad when you're not horny and turned on, right? Because it's it's actually really uncomfortable, even though it's the exact same 
type of stimulation. Pause. Spanking. Um, example. <laughs> I orgasm very easily. Lucky me. It is very lucky. I multiple every time. But. Good for you, man. Great. But, <laughs> hey, that's but, me. No, yeah. It's, <laughs> my, I feel like every my, partner my I've had has been like, right here. It's a little <laughs> awkward. But for real, I can. Yeah. And it's a blessing. Okay. From Jesus. But. <laughs> Jesus directly. Not Jesus. But. When I was in high school, I would be running laps in PE and I would orgasm while I was running. At a, not a time when I wanted not to horny. do that. And it yeah. was uncomfortable. Wow. And it was, I'd be like, huh? Ah. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, I'd be like, oh, okay, this is happening right now. It's yeah. kind of nice, but, but, also but also not overwhelming. Yeah. 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 Desired. And, yeah. You know, like no when, one talked to me about that. Even right. when I was younger than that, like, so, this is just, I'm being really honest. Sometimes, sorry, mom. Like, the first time I had an orgasm, I was sitting in the backseat of my family's car. Yeah. And, like, I had just my like legs over crossed. Bump, and like, then yeah. it was, like, a bump thing. And I was, like, ooh. And I just went. <laughs> and I just kept, like, rubbing. And then I had an orgasm. And I was, like, that felt good. I didn't know what the fuck it was. Yeah. I mean, that's really that's typical. That's little kids exactly. yeah. But that's what happened. Like, that's, you know, yeah. that happened. And so, so yeah, right. you're right. Sometimes you don't want to do that right and, it happens. and it's it may or may not be connected to yeah exactly being yeah. psychologically interested in sex yeah, I'm like, yeah. Oh, i don't want to do this with anyone else but this is right. nice and weird and <laughs> i don't want to do it at school well, right <laughs> right don't do it on the track for real yeah like, that's weird mm. but i think that um that idea that like pleasure is not about the thing that People come to me and yeah. they're like, I want to experience more pleasure. How do I have more orgasms? Yeah, and I'm like, mm-hmm. that's not no, 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 necessarily no. it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, as as that was you're a, illustrating, right? Yeah, I was yeah. like, it's happening. But the, but the connection to it is different than yes. when it's like intentionally happening. Right. And the reason for that is... <laughs> my body's so there's, weird. There's a, no, not at no. all. That's it's not My body's weird. weird. It's not weird. So much of my job, I feel like, is talking to people and being it's like, like yeah, that's it's actually like, normal. It's not the worst thing in the world, it's okay? But it was weird. Well, and that's, again, the thing that um, I feel very lucky to have been, had the opportunity to be that sex ed teacher for, yeah. like, high school girls, especially. That's there was amazing. a year where I got to, you know, be a, the full-time sex ed teacher for these high school girls mm. and, like, really have the opportunity to have those conversations with them yes. of, like, oh, no, yeah, that thing that you're feeling is normal. That thing you're curious about is a normal thing to be curious about. Yeah. Like, the way that you feel isn't that weird. Yeah. I, especially, you know, I've been in this, I've been in this sex ed game for a long time. People ask me like, "Oh, what's the weirdest?" Like nothing, nothing, no. nothing. Yes. There's nothing weird. That's the right answer. Yeah. And we need to hear that. That's the right answer. Yeah. It's not I like, mean, oh, Laura had orgasm. Would you <laughs> running? No, what that's a weird not weird. That's um, not weird. That's not weird. What's weird is when people are like really weird and repressed. Like the thing that would weird me out the most when I worked at sex shops is when mm. people would come in uh, and like women who were either with their boyfriends or sometimes like with their gal pals would be looking at the display um, dildos and be like, oh my God, that's so big. Why would anybody want that? That's so like gross. Oh. In this way where I was like, why are you here? <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? Be here, whatever. You're judging but the like, size. Yeah, what's, that's what is mean. that? What is that? What are you saying? Because right. also the, the toy that you're holding right now is within the normal bell curve of human penises. So what are you saying? What are you saying? Yeah, what, right. are, what, what are you saying? saying? And what are you saying? And why are you saying it so confidently as, like, it, it was specifically this framing of, like, who would want this? Like It's like shaming someone else. Maybe yes. say, like, I wouldn't want that. Right. Sure. Or that but one's not for me. That's too big for me. I would like this me. one. Very different. Right. Very different than saying, like, wow, whoever, that the person who buys this is, you know. It's it's a little, a slut like, slut whatever. shaming. Yes. It is a little slut shaming. It's like you've created an imaginary slut to be like, yeah. oh, right. she must be loose. Like, what are you talking like, no, about? No, like, vaginas are surprisingly expansive. Yeah, and some of them are bigger yeah. than others. Like, yeah. Yeah. I have a tiny vagina, okay? It's <laughs> tiny, and that probably would be too big for me. Yeah. But, like, some people have bigger vaginas. Like, also, I have two humans yeah. exited into the universe from my vagina. Yeah. It's what, like, vaginas can get real yes, big if they real, need to, they if they want to. Get a lot in As there. a person who has worked <clears throat> in sex shops and been to, you know, fetish parties, and yeah. I've seen a lot of things. And yeah. the human body is capable of a lot of things. When it's into it? A lot of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, people forget that, like, the, the vagina, when we talk about the actual vagina itself, is a muscle. So, like, yeah, any other right. muscle in your body, you know, if you... 
stretch in a healthy way mm. your legs mm -hmm. do they get permanently loosened no. no you just have like more of a range of motion if you stretch your legs in an unhealthy way more of a range of motion. do they suffer for it absolutely mm -hmm. um you know people experience a lot of pain discomfort tightness mm. from uh trauma yeah in that area but trauma yeah. is very different from like oh you know you've had sex before right. ergo you're Cons loose like, like what does that exploration yeah that's a again it's a it's based on this understanding of human anatomy that's so like not scientific of like no. your vagina is a muscle like any other muscle in your body why would it work in this fundamentally different way from any other muscle in your body yeah. mm. it's the same Thing. Did you guys see that TikTok thing that was going around where people were like feeling their like this thing and no. being like, oh my God, no. it feels like a penis. Like what? The, if you, the little like. Oh, like the head? Yeah. Oh, it does feel like a penis. <laughs> okay. So Can we yeah, see click I this. hope you're watching. Can I, click this? Yeah. I really hope y'all are watching. Does it feel like your penis? Do it's, it. <laughs> I mean, so the reason it feels that way is because it's uh, that part of your, of your tongue is called a frenulum. This is a frenulum too? Yes, and that's also what it's called on a penis. Yeah. a frenulum no is way. actually just a description of a So I have a penis in my mouth all the time? No. <laughs> no. But you have a frenulum. You have a frenulum. Mm, frenulums frenulum. are not exclusive to penises. Volvas oh. also have frenulums. You have multiple wait, frenulums wait, wait. in your mouth. Hold up. Yeah. Where else do we have frenulums? So there's a frenulum of here. There's a frenulum right. down here. It's oh, so it's just a, a, part, a skin, like... A little bridge. Yes, a little it's a bridge. type of connective tissue. Oh. And so, again, people okay. have, like, the TikTok oh. trend. I literally never upload TikToks, and I made one because this one was bothering me so much <laughs> that I was like, guys, it's not weird. Like, yeah, yeah it's cool. Like, sure, that's it's yeah. fun to be like, wow, the human body, but it's actually not weird. To no. act like it's something like like oh my god gross there's yeah. something about my mouth that's like that's has gross. in common with a peanut yeah no you're it's cool. Human being, cool your human body is made up of like the same yes. types of tissue it's not like a magical kind of tissue that you have in your genitals that's like, well, like again fundamentally different now, than yeah, any, right, any now other your part mouth of you is dirty. aren't our like, genitals like isn't it like the clitoris like it could be a penis if it grew. Yeah. Oh, if you look at fetal development, I don't think people know that human beings. You know, we start off from the same from the same soup. You know what I mean? When yeah. You look at fetal development. Um, it's the same specialized cells that are going to become these organs. Mm -hmm. There's actually a really great graphic that I use in my like sex ed for adult classes or like um, actually. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> um, Very cute. I use it in my sex ed. In, uh, classes also for young people, but it's mm -hmm. a, a diagram that has color coded, um, like an internal view of a clitoris, right? So not just the external part, but also the internal like arms mm -hmm. and the um, the vestibules that surround yeah. the vagina, and then a uh, diagram of a penis and yeah. testicles that is also color coded to show like these are the yeah. analogous tissues that at a, at the very early stage in fetal development you can see start to differentiate into these organs. Mm -hmm. So like the example that I like to use all the time is, um, I don't know why him, but Arnold Schwarzenegger and mm. I have very different bodies. <laughs> we are very different people. Yes. Very different people. <laughs> but we are both human beings. Uh -huh. And ultimately that means there are things about the ways that our bodies work that we do have in common mm -hmm. and that are useful for us to know about each other, right? Mm. I mean, I haven't called him to let him know like what's up with, my body we should do that. But I did watch Pumping Iron, which if you haven't seen it. Oh my god. It's so funny. He's he's a character. A um so, I did see Jingle All the Way. Also oh, a I classic. About that that is a classic. <laughs> Kindergarten Cops, my yeah. favorite. Um so yeah, that I think that understanding of again, it's one of the reasons why I started off in sex ed world, but then I went to social emotional learning and then mm. I went to body work and yoga and again, sort of grabbing these other practices and frameworks to, to build into what I was doing around pleasure because I realized that just being a sex ed teacher was not enough. Like mm -hmm. I can teach people all about how to put condoms on bananas, but if they don't know how to talk to their partner about using protection, What's the point? How have I helped them? Like, right. yeah. I can talk to people about protection and STIs. Yeah. But if I don't talk to them about, like, how to f know in their body whether or not they want to do something. Right. How much have I helped them if the goal is, like, for mm. to experience pleasure? Mm. Um, and a big part of, honestly, what I do is um, working with people 
around, again, they come in thinking, I want to organize my life around pleasure. How do I have more orgasms? How do I, um, like I had a really memorable, it was a half hour consult with this client. And I was like, that was the most half efficient half hour I've ever had where we started off and the client was like, I want to have an orgasm with another person. Like, that's my goal. I have a lot of sexual trauma. And the thing that I want to make happen is like having an orgasm with another person. So then we talked for about half an hour. And towards the end of it, I was like, okay, so based on everything that you've told me, you don't want to have an orgasm with another person. Hmm. Like you don't want to do that. That sounds, Aww. it's like scary. It's uncomfortable. There's a whole, there's a million other steps of exploring what pleasure is mm -hmm. that Before do not that. involve yeah. forcing yourself to want something because right. of what it would represent to you to want it. Right. right. What, it, what you Damn. think it means about you to have that thing. Yes. The idea that like, okay, I want to have more pleasure in my life. That means I need to have more orgasms is Again, it's this kind of backwards perspective of, no, an orgasm is something that can be part of a pleasurable experience. Mm -hmm. But a lot of my practice as a pleasure witch is like, wow, this flower is very beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's very like, it's very stimulating to my senses to mm. see something so beautiful and to yeah. really take it in. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when people ask me, what is that definition of pleasure that I'm working with? I usually talk about like having the psychological safety to be fully present in my body. Mm. And so I, ideally that's happening during sex, Wow, right? Ideally that happens mm. during sex, but ideally it's also happening a lot of places besides sex. Yes. I want to wow. feel that in as many places as I can. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want to feel psychologically safe enough to not have to mm -hmm. be cutting off certain parts of my perception yes. or fleeing my body that's, because I need to. I feel like I get a lot of pleasure of, in practicing magic and practicing 100%. witchcraft and living within that identity gives me a lot of that safety and that that sense of security that you're talking about. Right. How like do you do you use do you how do you look at sex as like a ritual? Is it like a magical you ever like perform literal magical rituals with sex or pleasure? Yeah, this is um it's a distinction that I find myself making a lot that pleasure, witchcraft, and sex magic are like there's an overlap, but they're different things. Yeah. Right? You're talking about different things. Because when we think about like a typical, like, oh, we're talking, talking about sex magic, it's like, there's a snake, yeah. there's a pentacle, you're naked, you're going to love it on my tits. Like, yeah, exactly. Which like, and, and that's fun. cool. That's cool. There's leather. There's a like, time and a place for everything. There's candles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's cool, 100%. but like, yeah, I'm just interested in like your perspective on. Like, how do these that, show that up spectrum. in your, like, yeah, yeah. witchcraft? Yeah. So, in my, my personal practice, right? Uh, the, the distinction I would say between pleasure witchcraft and sex magic is that pleasure witchcraft is a framework and sex magic is a practice. Mm. So, you know, some people's practice involves more or less of sex magic, which is using the kind of energetic power generated by sexual desire, mm -hmm. sexual stimulation, like orgasm. Mm -hmm. These are all very powerful energetic yeah. wells we can draw from. Mm. Um, but I would say, honestly, personally, in my life, I don't do a lot of sex magic in my in my pleasure witchcraft practice. Mm -hmm. um, not because I have anything against sex magic, but just because for me, a lot of what my pleasure practice ends up looking like is, again, rehabilitating my relationship mm -hmm. to pain, um, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and also, like, really indulging in non-sexual pleasures mm -hmm. um, and really yeah. exploring non-sexual pleasures from a, a, a you know, mm -hmm. yeah, just, like, extremely indulgent. I love exploring non-sexual pleasures. Yes. It's one of my favorite activities. It's very erotic. Yes. Yeah. It's just, like, food, existing, food. Mm -hmm. smelling the air, like... Being in your senses, Touch, right? Yes. Like being in your senses. Things. Yeah. And that is something that's why we're that alive. Is digging in through bodies. soil and making things grow mm -hmm. and like mm. touching. I was kissing my rose petals the yes. other day. Like feeling the softness. That. Like that's right. intimacy. And there's yeah. so many things that are even sub our perception, right? Like sensations that we're not consciously picking up, mm -hmm. but that our bodies are picking up yes. when we're interacting yes. with our environment and really being in our Ooh, senses. Like what? Well, I mean, you know, like the the idea behind grounding and like getting oh, your right, feet right, right. into mm -hmm. the earth, right? Yeah. That it's not just about like, oh, it feels nice. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's good there, to do, yeah, but also that there's there's intangibles. There's yes, like, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. is yeah. digging into yeah. the soil. There's a yes. connection that comes from you know, again, being psychologically safe enough to be fully present in your body. Mm -hmm. That is mm. like this is also at the heart of um, polyvagal theory, which is also like a foundational framework in uh, my professional work and mm. my personal practice, um, which is essentially the idea that, uh, like we've been alluding to, right, your human body evolved to 
make things pleasurable and make things scary, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And yes. to have the experience yeah. of I want to, I want more of that. I want to be closer to that, and I don't like that. Mm-hmm. I want to be further away from that. And I think we do such a disservice to ourselves as human beings in the 21st century in really trying to swim upstream against and fight against that like deeply embedded wisdom of your body saying like, I'm scared of that. Mm -hmm. You should stay away from it. Or Mm -hmm. I want that. We should get closer to it. Mm -hmm. Um, There's so much just like, I compare it to like holding a beach ball underwater where it's like the harder that you, the the further down you put it, the harder it hits you in the face when it pops back up. Absolutely. And you can keep doing that, but eventually you're, gonna be really sore and then you're missing you're out really uncomfortable absolutely yeah, yeah you're not playing with it you know exactly I mean? yeah. like, because those those crazy. things that make you uncomfortable i want to stay away from that are sometimes like really invitation yes i would say oftentimes mm-hmm. right yeah. having that attitude of of compassionate curiosity mm-hmm. towards your own like ugly feelings mm-hmm. yeah. again that's what i mean by you know rehabilitating my relationship to pain yeah. is a huge part of being a pleasure witch that mm-hmm. i have to recognize mm-hmm. that my capacity to feel pleasure is directly connected to my capacity to tolerate pain and to say like, okay, I'm, I'm, Mm -hmm. I can stay here long enough to understand what this discomfort is trying Mm -hmm. to tell me. And that's how I actually navigate towards pleasure. Pleasure, If I'm too overwhelmed to be in my body long enough to understand like, oh, I'm anxious all the time because I hate my job Mm -hmm. and it's not something wrong with me. It's that I hate my job yeah. and I shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, the reason why my body is not cooperating with me, even though I'm doing, yeah. I'm meditating and I'm, yeah. you know, I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to is because I keep putting myself in the circumstance mm-hmm. that my body is trying to motivate me away wow. from. Yes. And when you don't listen to your body, it gets louder. <sighs> and it yes. gets violent and yes. oppressive. Yes. And that reminds me of like this pursuit of purity through denying yourself yes. those things which is like religion right yes. like a lot of religious and then you know yeah people get hurt right yeah in the process yes like majorly that's hurt. why it's so america is so violent yes. because yeah. we were founded as a nation mm-hmm. on like those puritanical ideologies and we have that like severe I'm just like all I think about right now is like Ron DeSantis and like yeah no I mean the American the American culture is one that has completely pathologized every kind of pleasure except for the pleasure of domination yeah Mm. like the only appropriate way to pursue Mm -hmm. pleasure in our current social context is like the pleasure of and without consent yeah like without how can you how can you I mean that's I think politically very obvious that that's, I mean, it's not new information that narcissists and psychopaths are rewarded in American culture. Right. Like in finance and politics. Yeah. Tis manifest destiny. Simply an observable truth. But, you know, this reminds me of a conversation I was having with someone recently about the card temperance and like how Mm. in my practice, it took me a while to rehabilitate my relationship to that card because Mm. coming from this puritanical culture, I was like, Fuck that angel. Yeah, literally. I'm sorry to that angel, but... <laughs> wait, wait. Let's... What is... Te- I get confused with the temperance <clears throat> so meaning. In so. Rider Waithe, it's the... It's... Um, I think it's uh, Michael. Yeah. It's, who some has, say it's Michael. Some mm-hmm. say it's Raphael. Okay. Just it's depends. an angry yes. angel person. Um, no. Well, not angry. It's they're just angry. Yeah. yeah. No. It's the... I'm, oh, I'm thinking of justice. No, that's different. It's the... It's the... Okay, in my it's card, like it's a Leah. one foot in the... One Got foot it. in the water, one foot on the earth. Yes. Pouring between two cups. Pouring between two cups. It's the cups. Okay. So, you know, again, my association with temperance is like, and also, again, in the American context, what do we yeah. associate temperance with? Prohibition. Like, temperance means totally. you don't have any. Right. Temperance means it's puritanical, Prudence. it's restrictive. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So for a long time, I was like, fuck this card. Fuck like, this card. I don't want that. Yeah. I, I rebuke that yeah. uh, in my life. Oh, okay. So the work of, like, really becoming a tarot reader Mm -hmm. right not just playing around with the cards but being like i have a relationship to my deck yeah was trying to figure out how can i approach approach this aspect of my human experience with compassionate curiosity Mm. and the spolia deck actually that i was mentioning to you earlier really helped me with this because the iconography on that card shows temperance as a figure in um like a bondage harness yeah and that clicked something into place for me so quickly of like this card is about the pleasure of restriction and the yeah. pleasure that comes from mm, like certain kinds of self-denial, right? It's the thing of, it's the ice cream thing. Yeah. Huh. The less yeah. often I do it, the yeah. more pleasurable it is, the more special the moderation. it feels. Mm. Exactly. To me, it's like a moderation card. Yes. 
that's the song that I use. It's Aaliyah, and the song is "We Need a Resolution." We have so much confusion, but it's like, yeah, we need a yeah. It's just sort of like a yeah, not meant to be like completely restrictive, but right. having like moderated mm. well, bounds again, that you give yourself. I think going back to that, like one foot on the earth, one foot in the water. Yeah. it's like it's a recognition of the ways that our like physical and material and mm-hmm. you know resource stuff is connected to our emotional world. Yes, and yeah. a recognition that like yeah, it's not just about taking care of yourself because that's what you're supposed to do. Right. It's about creating the conditions for you to experience pleasure, mm-hmm. to be safe enough in your body and in your environment to, to enjoy experience living. pleasure. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty radical card. Right. I love temperance. Yeah. yeah. I, I had a big 180 on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that bondage harness really like, again, yeah. it really, it There's made something so accessible. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I love looking at different decks. decks. Yes. Yeah. Because it's like. They have different perspectives. Yeah. I talk about yeah. it like poetry, you know what I yeah. mean? Where it's, it's, yeah, the cards mean something, but it's in the same way that words mean things. Mm-hmm. And if you sit with a poem and the dictionary side by side and try to read mm. a poem that way of like, yeah. this word means this yeah. and this word mm-hmm. means that. Mm-hmm. Um, you're probably gonna have a really shallow experience of poetry. Yeah, you'll it's, be bored. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it, you're, you won't get it. You'll look at people who love poetry and be like, I don't yeah, understand. I don't, I don't get, get it. it. What are you getting yeah. out of this? And that's because like the relationship to, at least for the tarot readers that I mm-hmm. tend to connect with and talk to, is a lot more and poetic. It's yeah, about it's personal. vibes. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's, you know, I've come to understand like my role as a person who reads cards for others as like, the clients that I get are not just be, I'm the person that they need to have mm-hmm. read their cards. They're the people that I need to read cards for. You know yeah. what I mean? It's always for you yeah. too. It's always like, mm-hmm. oh, I needed, I needed this. Yeah, I needed this reminder mm-hmm. in this language that's so different from like. It's so amazing to me, especially now having been a reader for seven or eight years, mm-hmm. like to see how different people really do throw cards differently. Mm-hmm. And like, interesting. Like I remember the first time that I got strength in a negative placement for somebody and was like, <laughs> what does it mean? This is, I, I literally, this is like my favorite card. Yeah. Like my favorite. This yeah. Is, so I was like, I don't, I don't know. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to read, I'm going to interpret this the way that I best know yeah. how. Mm-hmm. And, you know, explained, I was like, this is what this card means and this is what reversal is. What does that mean to you? Yeah. And she was immediately like, oh, yeah, like I'm, I, I need to understand myself as weak. Like I need to understand myself as fragile. The problem that I'm having right now is that I'm relying on a kind of like I'm putting mm-hmm. my hands in the lion's mouth and I don't need to be. Yeah. Um, you know, and this was a black woman that I was speaking yeah. to. So I was like, yeah, I get that 100 percent that the the um, idea that yeah, your resilience can be something that's really beautiful and that connects you with mm-hmm. yourself and that feels really um, useful and, and powerful. Exhausting. Yeah, it's not really, again, there's no card in the deck that we're supposed to be in all the time. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. there's no card in the deck that is all the way good or all the way bad. Yes. It's very dialectical. Mm-hmm. Just like nature, like season. Just like everything yeah, else. Everything, yeah. Again, yes. to go back to that two of swords, there really, it, there is nothing in our natural world that exists in that kind of binary. Mm-hmm. That's an illusion that we create that sometimes is helpful. It can be right. sometimes helpful to, yeah. again, blind ourselves from certain information mm-hmm. and just go with that black and white right. thinking. But it is not natural. But it's not a permanent state of existence. And that's the reason yeah. why when you increase in the swords, mm-hmm. things get more painful like that's the reason why by the time you're at the ten of swords you're like i'm literally i can't move actually dead like i'm literally i'm dead wow (laughs) i literally i can't even (laughs) like i'm dead interesting Mm -hmm. and what comes right before that i can't sleep so yeah what happens when you can't sleep and you ignore that Mm -hmm. and you're like let me just take melatonin let me just like yeah you know have better sleep hygiene yeah and ignore the fact that like yeah i want a divorce you know what i mean like okay so what do you think is going to happen mm-hmm it's so interesting that you were saying like sometimes the cards that we pull are for us because we've been getting the two of swords a lot. (laughs) And we were saying the last time that it's for us. It's not like somehow it's for one of us or both of us or like the show as a whole or like something. Yeah. I definitely connect to that in multiple ways. So maybe it's for me. I don't know. It's just interesting that Mm. it keeps coming up because y'all that have been watching like know that that keeps coming up and we don't like, we, this is an authentic card pull. Like we're not doing yeah. this on you're purpose. This, yeah. I was shocked that. Yeah. And you shuffle. You know what you're doing. I mean, it's I've like done it a few times. A few times, Caitlin's yeah. done it. That's so interesting to me. 
I'm also, like, for me, I'm having this awareness now. When I'm working with tarot in, like, a client reader capacity, like, or just with myself and my spirits, Mm -hmm. the two of swords is often a reminder to, like, get thee to the crossroads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I finally got back to my altar and my craft with this new moon and this solstice and I realized as I was doing it and looking through all my stuff, I'm like, oh, I haven't done anything for myself magically since February. Yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of professional spiritual practitioners fall into because yeah. we're so much of service to our communities right. yeah. that we put ourselves on the back burner. I think I remember listening to the Conjure South podcast and Queen Cotillo was talking about that too. And I was like, ooh, that was a read for me. <laughs> um, yeah. But I kept, like, get the do the crossroads. Right. And, like, I did. But now I also, it's a reminder, like, but don't stop now. Right, yeah. Like, don't stop me now. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm, magic is real. Magic, magic is real. real. Magic is, I mean, yeah, this, like, the question that I would get all the time of, like, mm-hmm. oh, but do you really believe in this, like, crazy, like, <laughs> woo-woo stuff? And it's, like, I, like, I don't know if it is real, but I know it's true. Like, I don't know if it's, like, Boom. provable, but I know exactly. that it's it's happening. I'm, like, experiencing yeah. it. And I can't, I mean, I think we are talking earlier about, like, what is what is science? And to me, it's, like, science yeah. is the parts of magic that we've been able to figure out. It's yeah. the parts of how the world works that we have the senses and the capacity yeah. to understand. That we have enough, like, evidence by Western yeah. standards to and not even just that, qualify. but by, like, just coming back to that idea of, like, the human body is an imperfect instrument your perception is not all that right your ob- observation really is not, not all that yeah. like we know that eyes cats and dogs you. see the world differently than we do mm-hmm. yeah how arrogant to think that the way that we see yeah. the world is our the visual only qualifying way. Way. Yes. if i can't see it it's not real and yes. to, and also that knowing something is true is what makes it true right. like we talk all the time about how mystery and not knowing is the magic yeah. sometimes the that's part of faith. it yeah right. yeah and that's powerful mm-hmm. There yes. are secrets. There's secrecy. I mean, in the that's universe. what it means yeah. to have faith, right? Yeah. If I could mm-hmm. prove it, then it wouldn't be faith anymore. Then it wouldn't no. be fun. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't fulfill that wouldn't thing that bored. witchcraft fulfills for me, which yes. is that need for a spiritual connection that I believe mm-hmm. is part of our our human yeah. animal. Yeah. Like yeah. the way that we yes. are designed to work is mm-hmm. we are meant to have a relationship with something that is outside Bigger of than ourselves. yes, outside yeah. of ourselves. And to me, that feels very connected mm-hmm. to this reality that, like, yeah. Because I can't perfectly perceive the universe, and it would be ridiculous of me to think that I can. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know? It's humbling. Yeah. I don't know how things work. Yeah. I and just like, know what's working. The mystery is always going to exist. No one person is going to figure out right. every single thing of the universe. The person so who like, thinks that they have is, the, the mystery. is wrong, is the most wrong person. Is the most annoying yeah. person. Yeah. The most and annoying. the most <laughs> oppressive, yes. the most... Violent. Suppressed. The most insecure yeah. oftentimes. Insecure. Absolutely. That's a, that two of swords oftentimes is a reflection of, Ooh, I feel insecure. I'm holding it all day. Yeah. Yes. I don't feel safe. And so I need to I need to break this yeah. down yeah. into yeah. yes or no. Yep. Mm-hmm. I don't have tolerance for a spectrum of possibilities. Right. Yes. And that person also doesn't have a, a tolerance for pleasure, right? Mm. Like the spectrum of possibility that comes with being in your body enough to feel pleasure. Yes. Right? Being sensitive enough that you're like, I accept the possibility of discomfort yes. in my pursuit Fuck. of... Yeah. You have to yeah. accept the... Po- yes, the discomfort. I was literally... I picked up my kid... My kid. <laughs> my kid. My kid. That sounds so weird. Um, my kiddo <laughs> from camp yesterday. And I was like, what'd you guys practice today? And he was like, well, we learned scatting, but I didn't do it because I was uncomfortable. And I was like... Well, you missed an opportunity because it's the stuff that makes us the most uncomfortable that ends up being the most exciting, like, exploration. Mm -hmm. We don't learn things about ourselves unless we're uncomfortable. I will say, though, (laughs) on your kiddo's behalf, that I think that's a really – I do think that's a really – good and, and useful and powerful thing for yeah. them to have been able to recognize in that to moment say no. <laughs> because yeah. yeah like I think That's true like music yeah. dance a lot of forms of creative expression mm-hmm. they are very connected to our relationship to pleasure right yeah it's, yeah. it's about being in your mm-hmm. body enough mm-hmm. to allow these things to flow and I tell this to my clients all the time right if you're having a hard time experiencing pleasure by yourself what makes you think that adding somebody else into the equation is going to make that easier 
Totally. Everything that human beings do is harder when we feel observed. Mm. Like when it comes to this realm of self-expression and creativity. Yes. If if you have any kind of sticking points there, they're going to get even stickier when you're in an environment where you feel overly observed. Yeah. And... That has a physiological yeah. impact, right? Um, I my partner is a music teacher, and we talk about this a lot with mm-hmm. singing or playing instruments, where yeah. your psychological and emotional state really affects yeah. how able you are to physically oh, interact absolutely. with your instrument, whether it's an external or yeah. your physical instrument. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's it's like if your if your kiddo was my student, right? Yeah. Like, I feel like that would be. Probably the thing that I would say to them is mm-hmm. like, I think it's really awesome that you recognize that this was not the place to do it. What would you need to feel safe enough to try it? Like, what would be the environment yeah. that would be like, do you need to be alone? Do you yeah. need something in your environment to like something that's comfortable for you? Like oh, a more comfortable mm-hmm. chair? Do you want to light a candle? You know what I mean? Yes. These are These are the things that for me, okay. are the center of my practice, right? I'm taking this back home with me. Yeah. Damn, that's, no, it's no. taking my little inner child too. That's, there was an experience I had where, I'm a singer and like performer and I was singing in my room and it was very, I needed to be alone and feel mm-hmm. safe to do that when I was a kid. And this one time I was just like, do to do in my bed or singing like Tiffany or some shit <laughs> and, or like Debbie Gibson. <laughs> and, um, and my dad came in unexpectedly and I was like, Oh, are you singing? Oh, like, and wasn't mean about it, but, yeah. but that like, I remember that was like a traumatic moment. Oh, for me. I literally have a similar. You know I, mean? yeah. I was like talking to myself, just and like talking like, out loud, playing video games, and my uncle walked in and it did it. Like, was like yeah. what are you doing? And wasn't being mean. No, yeah, like, like wasn't making was fun. Just like, was trying kind of, like, to interact. Yeah, and, but it was so like I was like it was invading my, my space. Yes. Like it felt very invasive to me, and and it's like affected the way that I perform and and thing and sing and like mm-hmm. I'm okay now but like it's you know yeah there's needs to be conditions right. mm. but like needing I'm a person that needs a lot of space mm-hmm. to like explore creative creatively and like yeah because mm-hmm. I mean singing is a very vulnerable thing For sure. it's very mm-hmm. vulnerable and like playing music and instrument mm-hmm. whatever and like and when, learning is vulnerable. Yeah, learning like, is practicing vulnerable. is vulnerable. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because right? someone could judge you. And that's sort of why we talk about uh, when when young kids, young kids today are like <laughs> learning magic and just sharing everything yeah. they're fucking doing on TikTok. Yeah. It's kind of scary to me right. as someone who needed a lot of seek, secure space to like right. Safety, do that. And then privacy. having everyone comment mm-hmm. like, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And like. It's it's very over. It just seems like a lot to me, at least. I yeah, don't know. I've really I'm yeah. I'm like more and more kind of orienting myself towards like okay, everybody who follows me on Instagram, join my new- newsletter. You have a very healthy. Um, <laughs> thank you, but I don't want it anymore. A boundary. Um, I don't want that social media thing to be like a thing that I am engaging in anymore yeah. because yeah. for the thing that I do, I feel like a liar. If I'm like telling people right. you should live more pleasurably, but I'm telling you that on the hell app that's made to make you feel bad and to exploit that human animal and say, hey, you know how you care about other people because you're social fundamentally? Mm-hmm. I want to use that to make money. That's yeah. literally what mm-hmm. these platforms yeah. are for. You're not wrong. And if I know that's true and I know that I want all people to live an integrated life and the healthy pursuit of pleasure, mm-hmm. I'm not going to educate on Instagram anymore. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm not going to do the like, here's a bite-sized piece of information yeah. that you can use to, you know, because that gives people, I think, a false impression that they've done the work when really what you've done is gotten a little, you know, some little dopamine juice yeah. mm-hmm. and then you scroll down to an ad. Yeah. Yeah. You You're know, it's, right. it's not, it's not actually an environment for facilitating pleasure. It's not actually an environment for doing real education or real connection. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've been focusing so much more on one-on-one work at this point, because even when I'm doing group classes, I'm like, you know, this would be better if I could just tell you what you need. Yeah. Right. This would be better if I could talk to you about what you are worried about because mm-hmm. everyone's so different. I, l- I admire that so much about you, that you have the, that you're not willing to exploit your beliefs and like your, no gorgeous face <laughs> like yeah. it's nowhere on the gram like no, girl, no like, i had to scroll a baby, long way to find could. a photo you know I mean? i'm not <laughs> using my my thirst traps are all in private right, right, right. i'm not i'm not I using my pretty privilege shit out yeah. of that because it's just rare to meet people that like we've talked about like that you admire in right. the magical space and like that 
have those types of um, values and actually sure. practice what they preach. Absolutely. I mean, especially it's now. Really, it's really rare, at least in my experience, to mm-hmm. come across people like that, which is why we wanted to have you on the mm-hmm. pod. I mean, that's, you know, I think especially since, you know, 2014, 2015, when I was first, like, dipping my toes into this world, and it was still so very new, and just in the last, like, seven or eight years has become this thing that's, like, I mean, like, every subculture, right? Somebody figured out they could make money on it. Yeah. And now we have, like, huge brands being, like, what soap should you buy based on your astrology sign? Like, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Irish Spring. (laughs) (laughs) That's for Gemini's. Um, yeah. <laughs> LOL. LOL. The, yeah, I think that that it's honestly, I was talking about this with a friend the other day where I was like, I'm honestly getting sick of calling myself a witch professionally. I'm kind of getting to a point where I don't yeah. want to be like, I'm marketing myself as a witch because people come into it then having a different expectation mm-hmm. of what yeah. I'm doing because witch now has been co-opted yeah. by like the Instagram love and light mm-hmm. crystal grid people, yep, yep. you know, we talk about that a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not, it's, I mean, I am still a witch. I yeah. still identify as yeah. a witch, but when it comes to the way that I am presenting myself out in the world, yeah. mm-hmm. um, it's funny that you are like, oh, wow, you have such good boundaries. Cause I feel like this happens every time people say that to me where I'm like, it doesn't feel like I have good boundaries in an effortful way. It feels like my body just does not let me do the other thing. Mm-hmm. Like I get so right. physiologically distressed from not doing the thing that I need to do that it stops feeling optional. But that mm-hmm. distress is informing you and like no, you're it's listening. Good. I like it. You're I used able to, to not listen. like it. I like it now. Yeah. Yes. Because I started listening to it. I didn't like it when I wasn't listening to it because it made my life miserable. Yeah. yeah. And I felt bad all the time. Yeah. But once I started listening to it and yeah. was like, oh, you don't like that? Okay, I won't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Then I actually started to feel better and we didn't have to mm-hmm. be enemies. Yeah. Like me and yeah. my sensitive tummy didn't have to fight anymore. No, Instead yeah. I could be like, oh, my tummy's sensitive. We're friends now. Yes. And like, maybe I should leave this room, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh my mm-hmm. tummy sensitive. Maybe I should lay down. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I come from a world of selling tchotchke, clout chaser, appropriation weirdos. So yeah. that's who I you know, it's it's I'm a business person like right. that. So yeah, to if I'm also a witch, my business is a little different than what you guys do. Right. But so yeah, I see more of that just like who do I got to like? Who, yeah. who do I got to sh- There's a lot of more strategy that goes into like building yeah. your brands right. and shit. And it's a little exhausting to just witness. So yeah. when it comes to like my personal friend space, I appreciate both mm. of you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a kind of um, work that I feel really lucky to do that I can say like actually like I don't want to do the like click funnels thing mm. and have that not be like – could I be making more money that way? Maybe. But the type of, like, the quality of connection that I have with my clients is so rich. And almost all of them say some version of that in our first conversation of, like, mm-hmm. the reason I'm talking to you is because I don't feel like you're trying mm-hmm. to sell me something. And I feel like you actually want to help me, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm yeah. talking to you because I haven't heard somebody say the thing that you said before. And mm-hmm. the thing that you said was, you know, Instagram or whatever. Yeah. Like, that's why it's so important like as readers I think that it can be really easy to get overwhelmed because there's a seeming oversaturation of readers out there but if you are showing up as your authentic self Mm -hmm. whatever that means for you Mm -hmm. whether it's Instagram or I I love Instagram Instagram, whatever it is I'm a YouTube I only have a newsletter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can find my forum from 1992. Like whatever yeah. my, my way you show is up. still available. My GeoCities. As long as you show up authentically, <laughs> there are people who are looking specifically yeah. for you. And it's hard to believe if you've never done it. Mm-hmm. And you will never believe it if you never do it. If you never show up as yourself. Yeah. If you keep trying to be like that person, like that person, yeah. like that person, you're never going right. to experience how incredible it feels right. when you have a yes. client shop at your table and say, like, I came to you. I'm here for you. Because you're yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I've been thinking a lot about this mm-hmm. in just like, again, spiritually, professionally, how I keep mm-hmm. these things aligned, that I'm more and more moving away from like, I'm an educator to I'm an expert. If you're mm-hmm. coming to my table, you're coming for my expertise. Mm-hmm. We're not going to, like, and this comes from working mm-hmm. in specialty retail, honestly, and mm-hmm. being at, working at a sex shop and being like, working at a sex shop is way better than working at Target. Yeah. Because when people come to talk to me, they know I know more than them. Yes. There's yeah. a, there's something that they're coming to from me that's not just like, um, 
can you fold this or whatever? Right. Like, um, I knock this over. I Do you have a size two? <laughs> yeah. It's, this it's in the back. Two, four, five. What it's is like it? I have, a, I have to girls? have a conversation with somebody about maybe something that they've never talked about yeah. even with the people that they have sex yes. with. So yes. it's a very different kind of relationship. And I want people who are coming to that table because they're like, I want – I know the the thing that I value and the mm-hmm. thing that I want. I just know also know that I don't know how to do it by myself, mm-hmm. right? And then that's where and I can step in. And that you can help yes. me. Yes. Right. I love that. And by doing that and living like that and finding what gives you pleasure in life mm-hmm. and leaning yes. into it, you're not compromising like anything really. Right. Like, I mean, that's why it's tolerable to be broke, right? Because yes. on a day-to-day basis – have, have, am I broke? Yes. But when I think about like, if I had to color in how many days I feel like at least one time that day, like, wow, I'm so lucky mm-hmm. to be experiencing this thing mm-hmm. that I'm experiencing right now. Yeah. Like you don't have to have a lot of money to make that happen. Yeah. No. Don't get me wrong. Financial anxiety is really real. Yes, like is it absolutely that, that like paralyzing like scarcity stuff is Every very month. very real. <laughs> Rent's about to be due. Mm-hmm. And I'm not. You know, <clears throat> it's uh, it's unpleasant. Yeah. But yeah. that kind of unpleasant is very different from the kind of unpleasant where it's like I can't tell you how many people I talk to where it's like, okay, you want to have more pleasure mm-hmm. in your life. What do you like? And they're like. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what it yeah, feels like to like something well enough to really identify. Oh my gosh. I like this thing. Yes. So much of my work revolves around that yeah. with people. They come to me because they're like, I want to have a spiritual practice. I want to mm-hmm. be a medium like you. And then they're shocked because their guides are like, step one is yeah. getting to know yourself. Right. And you can't get to know yourself until you know how to take care of it's yourself. It's really like, get back in the house. Yeah. Like, you're water. not ready yet. Yeah. Like, drink water. Mm-hmm. Like, eat food again this client who was mm-hmm. like i want to have an orgasm with another person i was no you don't no, no you don't and the more that you try mm-hmm. and push yourself towards wanting that or doing that the more you're going to traumatize yourself frankly. absolutely like the further yes. back you're putting it's like it's like any other kind of you know skill building mm-hmm. like for the body right if i go to the gym and i've never worked out before and i go straight to like yeah, the 500 you're gonna hurt. Pounds. Yeah. I'm going to injure myself <laughs> and then I'm going to have a really hard time getting into strength training because yes. I've injured mm-hmm. myself mm-hmm. and also I'm going to have proven to myself maybe what I already thought was yeah, true which you, is I can't work out you can't start at the finish line no no nobody does it's honestly it's hmm. it's some it's a way that we are encouraged to think because capitalism but right. it is one of the most self-sabotaging ways of thinking Absolutely. that are out there like it's a it's a horrible trap uh, and it oftentimes yeah it gets us into situations that I mean, I can think of many examples in my own life where mm. it's like I did something unconsciously to prove to myself the the bad thing that I already believed mm-hmm. was real was true. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I'm I'm that's magic in itself, isn't it? <laughs> and you know, again, coming to recognize like, ooh, I'm I'm uh, my energy is doing things when I'm not paying attention to mm-hmm. it, right? You can I again this conference with this mm-hmm. woman who I heard speak was amazing. One of the other things she said was, you can live your life by design, or you can live your life by default. Mm-hmm. You yeah. can be a witch by design, or you can be a witch by default. Yeah, yep. whether or not you know it, you're energetically doing stuff. Yep, it's about whether or not you're doing that on purpose or not. Yeah, it reminds yeah. me of like money doesn't buy happiness. No, it can if you're like it can buy security. It can yeah. buy you out of problems. But I mean, it can if like you're doing something that you love. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. It's. I mean, it is that sort of, I hate to invoke the hierarchy of needs, but that the more, I think, uh, intuitive version of the hierarchy of needs, which is, yeah, we have different dimensions of need to be well, Mm -hmm. right? There's a reason why I use the phrase psychosocial wellness. It's about not just my mental health, my emotional health, my physical health, my social health. All of these things are part of what it means to be well as a human being. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having in mind that we need all of these things to be well, yeah, financial in a world under capitalism, not having money makes it a lot harder to get a lot of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're in a circumstance where you can, you know, reach into your pocket and infinitely know you're, that you're not going to hit the bottom, there are certain problems uh, or certain issues, certain things that because we live under capitalism, yeah. it is easier to navigate around. Yeah. That's not like a natural thing about, no. you know, That's how not the how world this works. That's not how was designed. No. no. It's like a function. That's a right. function of that Yeah. Capitalism. I mean, we were yeah. talking about this before we started recording yeah. that like neurotypical just means that you're compatible with capitalism. Yeah. Like neurotypical means that you can hold on a job. It doesn't mean your brain is better. No. Maybe the goal of like, I want to be rich. I need a bigger, like it's. I don't, maybe it's just unlearning that standard. 100%. And like for happiness, right? It's like, 
oh, like, I'm actually happy now where I yes. am, like, with what I have to a certain extent. Yeah. Like, that seems like a nice, like, that's like the pain. I don't explain yeah. it as well as you, but like, it's like the pain pleasure 100%. thing, you know? I, so there's a somatic exercise that I do with people um, that is... Don't try this at home because there's more instruction that goes into it <laughs> and it, is, it can potentially be dangerous because I ask people to do closed eyes balancing exercises right. and it is almost impossible to balance when you have your eyes closed because of mm. how your vestibular system works. It's hard. So it's a practice of intentional failure and the purpose of doing that mm. exercise is to see how you talk to yourself when you fail at something that you know is impossible. Mm -hmm. Why are you so mad at yourself for failing at something that you know is impossible? Yeah. Why are you pushing so hard to succeed at the thing that you know is impossible? Yes. yes. And helping people to start to, like, oh, yeah. in, incorporating that into my own somatic practice was a big part of unlearning perfectionism mm -hmm. and starting to recognize, like, happiness is not a place that I get to by accomplishing things. It's a way that I feel by paying attention to my body. Mm -hmm. And balance is a really good way to practice that, yes. right? I, how do I keep my balance? I pay attention to what's going on in my body. Yeah. How do I know I need to put my foot down before I fall? Mm -hmm. I pay attention to what's going on in my body. Mm -hmm. And again, wow. there's a lot more instruction that goes into the dialogue of this, but it's all designed around helping people to feel that experience mm, of if I listen to myself actually, then this impossible thing can be pleasurable. Mm -hmm. It can be pleasurable to experience this failure yes. because I'm experiencing it feeling psychologically safe enough to be fully in my body. Right. That's yeah. really, I have a lot, I have trauma from going to Being a, a two-year, no, like <laughs> yeah. literally like going to a two-year conservatory mm -hmm. or like, cause there are arts that require like, like ballet is a good example. Yes. Like there is a standard that you need to reach. And if you don't, there's a lot of negative feelings like it's, I can see I mean, your lunch it's literally There's why are you even it's doing problem. this yeah and why are you even here mm -hmm. I didn't I'm I didn't grow up doing ballet 24 7 but I have trained in like other areas and like <clears throat> tap is my thing and like there's like the arts can be like I went to a two-year very intense acting school for two years and all I did were a lot of exercises like the antithesis to what you're saying right. like a lot of Controlling. learning how to be a clog in the machine mm -hmm. of the theater like yeah. how to work well with others in an ensemble like we did this thing called viewpoints where we would walk around in a room and not try to not hit each other like at full speed so be as be as be as aware yeah. of your surroundings as possible it's in a like, very fearful way in a very fearful yeah. way and we did this thing that that was this japanese art of like um, trying to perfect impossible tasks, but the mm -hmm. exact opposite of what right. you're saying. Like, and, and, and like, it's like soldier training almost. Mm -hmm. Like it was these things that it really fucked me up psychologically. Yeah. And like, I'm still unlearning a lot of the perfectionism standards mm -hmm. that I was taught because they are preparing you to like be a professional right. theater person. But it's like, it's, it's in it. I just don't, I just, I'm unlearning so much of it and it's, it's harmed me in ways that like, I don't think people talk about because it sounds kind of silly, like, oh, but it's the same thing as like a church religious thing yeah. almost like there's these standards that, which I don't have experience with church at all, but I would think that's sort of for me, like maybe the closest thing I can mm -hmm. feel to that. Right. Like it's, it's. And I know other people that went to this school too that d they don't de uh, they don't debrief you before they let you leave. Mm -hmm. It's just you just go out into the world like this, right. and then Fence. it's oh, tough. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty right. wild. But that's those those exercises are beautiful, and like the way I interpret dance and singing and art and creativity, how I've always have, but especially after that is like there is a I don't give a if you're a terrible dancer, like your quality of movement, your intensity, your like full, like however mm -hmm. you want to move your body is like right. right. All bodies yeah. are right. Like all voices are right. Like, yeah, good and, dancing is dancing where you feel psychologically safe enough yeah. to be present in your body. And that yes. being like that, that come that that's the goal with right. any performer is like to be that present and that comfortable. And that's what people want to watch. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes people eat. Not to go on a creative performance tangent but like that's what makes people yeah not not hammering people into being a certain thing mm -hmm. like i'm gonna cry now that that's important too because i lost a lot of my individual confidence right. when i did that mm -hmm. and it really f sucks yeah. and um it's effortful to get that back like it's mm -hmm. something that I'm we're 
cry. To give away. No, it really it's sucks okay. to yeah, be okay. like, your voice isn't as good as so-and-so's. Right. Or, like, yeah, it was. I'm a fucking good singer, okay? Mm. <laughs> like, it's just... Well, and the, it's, it's like ter- it's the follow-up awful. to that of, then you don't get to sing. But it's like, because your voice isn't good enough, it's, you don't get to sing. It's when it's weird. Singing is a, it's a part of our, mm-hmm. like... It's part of human nature. And it especially yes. sucks, you know, when it comes from, like family or yeah. and which has yeah. happened to me too and it's just like people that have you know sibling rivalries and things right. and like parents that put one above the other mm-hmm. and stuff like yeah. it's i mean again this and but this is a byproduct not of art and creativity but of capitalism yeah right? mm-hmm. it's yes. like if, without exactly. capitalism art and creativity would not need to be competitive in a way that exactly. then engenders this anxiety exactly it would just be a part of our again, what it's supposed to be which it's is part of our self-expression yes. part of our emotional what hygiene it always was before mm-hmm. which was just part of being a human just expressing yes. and and i really i i want to like do or teach maybe that's something we could collaborate on but like having movement classes like Mm -hmm. magic movement classes because like indigenous peoples like pre you know pagan people like we moved like we we did ritual Mm -hmm. with movement and i think a lot of people are just out of their body spaces in that way and it's it's the the thing i see the least of on witch talk you don't ever see someone actually doing Mm -hmm. a moving spell like or just you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like yeah, I don't know. I just or, think I mean, that'd be do, an interesting thing. It's like the ceremonial too. magic context, right? Where it's like it's all very ordered and structured or it's and like has a almost to like a <laughs> sign right there. But like when people point to the corners, let's uh, let's yeah, cut yeah, that yeah. out. The gestures. When they do gestures to like right. different whatever, but it's all very like it's not free. It's not about yeah. expression, right? There's there is an appropriate utility to structure, but there is also a, yeah. a desperate deficit of self-expression. But you in have our to culture. be to perform witchcraft in general for me, you have to be comfortable in your own space like you're saying right. like this is the that's what mad that's what makes you able to focus your intent yes. and your energy is being like in that state yeah. of mind. I tell people all the time, like when I talk about witchcraft, I talk about it as you know, you have int- intuition and manifestation. Those are fundamental things all people can do. That's yeah. our starting point. If you agree, let's go. We're off to the mm-hmm. races. But then the second thing to acknowledge and to internalize is, and you have to do the intuition first. Mm-hmm. Like you, I think people want to, they were like, I want to get into magic. Get- I want to do a spell. Yeah. I want to, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I want to go yeah. buy a d- spell that's already been done for me and mm-hmm. then it's going to fix my life. Yeah. And that is a very, again, capitalistic mm-hmm. Western perspective mm-hmm. on what spirituality is or how spirituality should serve us. Yeah. You know, you need to have your hands on the steering wheel before you hit the gas pedal. Yes. You need to yes. know where you're going and why you're going there before you start going. Yeah. Because if you start going with all the dysfunctional capitalism stuff that's still stuck to you and left to you yeah guess where you're gonna end up Mm -hmm. because like our magic requires our actions to meet our intentions and if we're not in tune with our intuition then we are not making moves in our day-to-day life that align with what we really want exactly that's alignment that literally is alignment what are we talking about being aligned Mm -hmm. it's not about me being aligned with my environment necessarily it's about me being aligned with myself Yes. And listening to what my body is telling me about the environment, yes. right? Listening yes. to what yes. my, I am actually yes. knowing and intuiting and mm-hmm. have wisdom about in yeah. my body. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. That's like invaluable advice and information. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy. It feels crazy, especially having been, um, you know, in this work for my entire professional career, most of my adult life, like I've been in this in this world. So to me, I'm like, Obviously, right? Mm-hmm. Like, okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so uh, so obviously, we're all on the same page, right? That no. like people are people, and no, of course we're not. Of course no. we're not. But I think so. We're not, but also we are because mm-hmm. you know that poem, "Wild Geese," Mm-mm. Mary Oliver. Mm-mm. You don't have to be good. You don't have to crawl through the desert on your hands and knees. It's a very beautiful poem, mm. and it ends with the line, or it's not the very end, but it's towards the end. Um, you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Mm. If I see somebody post that poem on their Instagram, you know what I mean? If I see somebody quote that poem mm-hmm. in a conversation, I'm like, wow. you're a witch. Whether or not yeah. you know it, you're a witch. Yeah. Because if you are, like, I remember when the first time I read that poem mm-hmm. and how much I, like, cried and was like, oh, my God, this is such a. Should is, we read it? I mean, yeah. I'm going to read it. Oh, my God, we can do a little dramatic reading. <clears throat> it's yeah. a very beautiful poem. Um, what is it I mean, called? Uh, Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. And she's a great um, poet in general. She's got a couple of poetry books that are, it's all along those same lines. I would really encourage you if you're somebody who's like, I'm oh, working gosh. through perfectionism or I'm working through, I mean, exactly the stuff that we're talking mm-hmm. about. Um, pick up a book of Mary Oliver poetry, you know. 
See All what right. it gives you. <laughs> this is the poem by Mary Oliver. Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. That's fucking beautiful. That's a really, like, honestly, that's how I feel about connecting to the world and magic. And right. it's such a beautiful fucking poem. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like I've I said, I've never cried this much on the podcast. It's cancer season. Welcome, I'm a y'all. cancer. Yeah, I'm usually the one who cries all day. <laughs> this that's, is, I'm usually not a crybaby. This is actually really. I you're really not. Cry. I'm not a crybaby. I cry all the time. Oh, oh yeah, you've seen I have me. A yeah, we, right yeah. everyone else is crying, and I'm. We like, had a spectrum of crying, and mm-hmm. I was in the middle. <laughs> Julia, I like was cry at the top. for other people. <laughs> like I just, mm-hmm. I'm always crying. I, I crying will say, is pleasurable for me. I was gonna say, yeah. yeah, I don't. I do cry actually often. <laughs> I usually don't cry around people because, again, it's hard to do things mm-hmm. around other people. But I yeah. definitely am a person who's like, I'm crying because this bee is so cute. It feels like, so good. You know what I mean? I'm crying yes. because I love my cat so much. Like, yes. these things that are... Oh my God. It is very cry. pleasurable. The, the earth makes me cry. Yes. cry. All the One time. One of my me biggest, cry. like, pleasure, like, pleasure witch moments, right? Mm-hmm. This was maybe a year or two after I graduated. This was, like, a big pivot point for me was I had just broken up with somebody and I was, like, sitting in my bathtub crying and I just had this, like, ecstatic experience of, like, how amazing it is that my human body has the capacity to feel Mm. this huge thing, like this huge feeling that's so like, like again, Mm -hmm. I was, I I was in the bath. I think that's significant. I felt psychologically safe enough to Mm -hmm. be in my body and be in my despair, right? To be Mm -hmm. like, wow, I feel really bad. And that is feeling something like that's what it is to be alive. I will say, I, you know, I don't always feel that way when I'm Mm -hmm. sad. Like it's it's not always accessible. And I think it's important as practitioners, Mm -hmm. right. To make that clear to people that, yeah, it's not just sunshine and roses every day. You don't always have to appreciate your grief. No, no, no. no. But having that ecstatic experience was, like I said, a big pivot point in my practice. Yes. Because it was, again, it was part of recognizing, oh, this isn't just about feeling good. This isn't just about doing stuff that's fun and sexy and, mm-hmm. you know, it's yes. not It's not just about the, like, we glamour really and the beauty. We really haven't talked about, like, actual intercourse at all in this episode. How are you and doing I, it? <laughs> it's like, actual intercourse. It's one of these. Yeah. I don't know. Yes, actual. because, like, How are we doing it? I don't so, know. Pleasure is just so It's beyond that. Well, and here's the thing. And incredible. And, like, intercourse just is just this that. little blip. It's a little yeah. thingy. That's a part of this huge... Yeah, and it's a it's a way that you can explore pleasure, but it's not the only one. And again, mm-hmm. your capacity for exploring that pleasure sexually is also very dependent on your capacity for experiencing non-sexual pleasure. In the mm. same way that it's harder to do things with another person than it is to do them alone, it's harder to do yeah. things that are sexually vulnerable than it is to do things that are other kinds of vulnerable. Right? Absolutely. It's easier to put yourself in other kinds of um, yeah. you know, uncomfortable situations than when there's a sexual element. Mm. So... You know, yeah. take, wow. like, again, if you're going to the gym for mm-hmm. the first time, maybe get the mm-hmm. one-pound dumbbell, right? Yeah. Like, maybe don't go straight to the hardest version of it um, because I, as a practitioner, right, I'm saying I still don't cry around people very comfortably mm-hmm. or easily. That's, like, that doesn't mean that I'm not a pleasure witch. That mm-hmm. means that in recognizing what my body is telling me, my mm-hmm. body is telling me that that's actually... That's an uncomfortable place for me to be. It's not for me. Yeah, and And maybe it'll be for me at some point. But the way it will become for me is not by me making myself do it. That part, right? Yeah. In the same way that if you have a scared child, if you have a scared animal, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, I, I want to say, would you really yell at them? And obviously the answer is that there are people who would say yes, and that's very sad, Mm -hmm. but should you, right? Like what will happen if you do, you know, if you have a scared animal that's going to the vet for the first time Mm -hmm. and you force them in the carrier, you know what I mean? And you put them in a situation where they're being restricted and confined and it's painful and it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Their cries are being ignored. The next time they have to go to the vet, 
how do you think they're going to feel? Yeah. yeah. Terrified. And Absolutely. why wouldn't they be, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if, if, again, like, right, talking to this client who's like, I want to have an orgasm with another person. Yeah. If, if after that conversation, right, if we hadn't spoken and that day she had tried to, like, have an orgasm with another person, yeah. I really believe that it would have set her back in her progress and in her healing mm. because, yes. again, everything else that she said after she said that sentence was some version of, I don't, though. Like, I'm not ready to. I'm not comfortable to. Like, it's it's terrifying. These, yeah. are, these are all of the things that I, I make me not want to do it. And I will say that's a that is a conversation that I have had with many clients mm-hmm. some version of that right I want to do x okay tell me about it it's and then awful. you know as soon as they tell me I'm like no you don't yeah right? like maybe right. you want to be a person who does x but what does that really mean yeah. what's that really about and how can you get that need met in mm-hmm. a way that is that your body consents to yes right I feel like that's not uncommon during tarot readings just like in general yes. like somebody comes to the table and they're like this is the thing and then <laughs> A good reader takes the time to, like, right. get to know a person, talk yeah, to them, yeah. and then by the end of the conversation, you're like, okay, you came here saying this, but what I'm hearing is this. Is this. Right. So mm-hmm. we're going to talk about mm-hmm. this now. And that's why mm-hmm. it's like, you know, I'm, I don't put the pressure on myself to be like yeah. a like, <clears throat> person who's doing, you know, like the type of reading that is very marketable, but that to me feels so like, this doesn't mean anything. Like this feels empty to me because Mm -hmm. the kind of work that I am doing is not generalizable, Mm -hmm. frankly, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's a level of um, utility, I think, to, to seeing other people's Mm -hmm. readings in the sense that, you know, it's cool to read poetry. It's cool to like explore yeah. ways mm-hmm. of being that are not your own. Yeah. But when it comes to what I see my work as being, mm-hmm. I'm not an entertainer. I mean, I am an entertainer, but not like that. The tarot is not for entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the 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 thing that I'm doing tarot for is again to connect to, like, I call myself a tarot doula on my website mm-hmm. because to mm-hmm. me it's like I'm I'm here to help you do right. the hard work mm-hmm. of connecting to your intuition. Mm-hmm. I'm actually not. You're you're the one who's working in this mm-hmm. scenario. Yes. I'm here to walk beside you and mm-hmm. be like, here's a tool. Here's a tool. Yes. Here's a tool. Here's a fact. You know what I mean? Here's mm-hmm. a practice. Here's something that you can do. But ultimately, especially working with trauma-impacted people, it's a very, very two of swords, very common thing mm-hmm. that they'll come to me and be like, give me a list of books, right? Or mm-hmm. like, give me like a list of, like, just tell me the thing that I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And so much of what those first sessions are about mm-hmm. are like, so the whole, you came to me to help you learn how to trust yourself. Mm-hmm. How are you going to learn how to trust yourself by me just telling you what you should do, mm-hmm. right? That sounds like how mm-hmm. I teach witchcraft mm-hmm. to people. <laughs> Similar. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I can't just tell you. No. You need to explore. My witchcraft may or may not be, like, when I teach about pleasure witchcraft, I am very, like, <laughs> probably to an extent that's annoying, I'm like, every slide, I'm like, and just to reiterate, this is just how I feel. Like, yeah, this doesn't yeah, have yeah, to be yeah. how you yep. feel. This mm-hmm. is just take how you, I feel. Take what you want. Leave yeah. the rest. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, it, you know, the the purpose I see <laughs> mm-hmm. in sharing my practice is not like, hey, guys, you should do it like I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's to say, like, hey, here's an example of what is possible. Yes. Like, we need those opportunities for radical mm-hmm. imagination because it's a cliche, yes. but it's true. If exactly. you don't see it, you don't know it exists. It's exactly. True. So it's, we were talking about this with relationship anarchy stuff last night too, that for me it's very important to like be open about what it is to be a relationship anarchist mm-hmm. and to help people see. Um, like I, We were talking specifically about this conversation I had with a friend not very long ago where I was talking about the phenomenon of compersion, which is like, I'm, it's the opposite of jealousy. It's I see my partner happy with somebody who's not me, and I feel really good. That makes me feel really happy. Um, and so I was talking about this with my friend and talking about, uh, you know, somebody that I was dating and uh, their partner that they live with and how I was like, yeah, I'm really excited to meet her. Like, you know, I want to like bring her cookies yeah. or something. Like, I, like, she seems really cool. And that my friend was like, okay, hearing you talk about this, I am just now realizing, like I'm having a brain blast moment of realizing I've never even considered a universe in which, like in an open relationship, yeah. like I would be, f- I would have a positive relationship with, with the other partner. With the other partner. Yeah. Like I literally could not imagine a world where, like the best case scenario is that we don't hate each other, but like in no, mm. in no universe are we friends. Mm. And that's like, yeah, if you literally have never 
even had that cross your mind, Mm -hmm. how are you going to know if that's something that you want? Mm -hmm. I feel very lucky in my life that the kind of like the kind of relationship anarchy anarchy that I practice means that I get to experience like an abundance of love in my life, like love that's like multiplies on itself. Mm. And that's not to say that everyone should be not monogamous. You can be monogamous and still be a relationship anarchist. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is to say that again, being a relationship anarchist to me means. I negotiate the needs, wants, and boundaries of my relationship based Mm -hmm. on the people in that relationship. I listen to my animal body. They listen to their animal body, hopefully. We communicate about those things, hopefully, Mm -hmm. and we come to what works for both of us. I got that song. The song just popped in my head. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Like they do on the Discovery Channel. It's a classic. Is that one in the deck? No, it should, should be. be. It, it should be, be. temperance. Yeah. <laughs> We're nothing but mammals, you know? <laughs> We're animals. <sighs> oh, yeah. Wow. But yeah, it's it's um it's about it's about like to whatever extent I do want to show up on Instagram or in public, mm-hmm. right? I'm starting to shift my perspective from this is a place where I do education stuff to yeah, I think I want to start sharing more of my practice in that way of here's an example of what it looks like to be a pleasure witch. That's actually the thing that feels more useful than being mm. like, here's a little like fuck toy that mm-hmm. you can, you yeah. know, tuck in your back pocket is to say like, I mean, I'm at some point going to have to upload a video being like, hi guys, here's where I'm not on Instagram, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and saying in public, which I guess I'm doing right now, like I, you heard I, it here first. You heard it here first. It's the exclusive. <laughs> but to say directly to my followers, like, I don't want you to engage with me here. And yeah. I, based on, based on my experience in my career so far, it's like, that's the kind of thing that I would say to somebody and they might be like, mm-hmm. are you insane? But based on my experience in my career so far, Every time I do something like that is when I have the biggest like. That's when everybody decides to sign up for exactly. the email list. Literally, when I tell them I'm literally. leaving, yep. that I can't do yes. this anymore, they're yep. like, <laughs> "It's and, and it's, it's also the when people are, they're complex. like, oh, I want to book a reading or I want to talk to you.' Because again, it's it's I've never heard somebody yeah. who makes a living doing this say it's not in alignment with my values mm-hmm. to like pay for Instagram ads. <laughs> you know, like it's a it's a unfortunately kind of a rare thing and I know for myself right when I'm looking for someone who I want to do any kind of intimate vulnerable work with that's something that I'm looking into too every person that I follow you know what I mean all the people that I'm subscribed their newsletters Mm -hmm. it's because I'm like I can tell by the way that you do things Mm -hmm. that you give a fuck about what you're doing I can tell by the way you do things that your values led in what Mm -hmm. you do a hundred percent right It's like um, our colleague that we were talking about before where like the first time we talked, she was like, I want people who will say no to me. I want people who will disagree with me and tell me when I'm wrong Mm because I know that I don't know as much as you know. Yeah. And I was like, bet. I want to work with this white woman. You know what I mean? Like I want to work with a white woman who walks up to me and says, I want people who will say no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to work with people who are are again revealing in their way of speaking and what they do and the mm-hmm. choices that they make that they care more about the work than they care about their ego than yeah. they care about doing yeah. things the right way Absolutely. right yes um i and those are the people that i want to give my money to and give my time and attention to mm-hmm. so why yeah. would i play to like the lowest common denominator when again i know enough I know enough to know that if I were to be making money in that way, I would mm-hmm. be doing it by taking advantage of people's psychology. Mm-hmm. Like yep. that, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to trick people into giving me their money. I mm-hmm. want people to give me their money because they feel like I am <laughs> helping them in their lives, right? I want people to give me their money because they're like, wow, that was really helpful. You should eat. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you should have a place to live because yeah. that was really helpful and I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Solid. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, Haylin, how do the people who want to work with you find you and support you? Well, luckily, my name is really Googleable. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. My website is my first name dot c o h a y l i n, and that's the same for pretty much whatever platforms I am on. Which you'll notice if you go on my Instagram that I haven't updated in a while, and as you said, my face isn't on it. Um, <laughs> not, so you can find her. me on Instagram at Haylin dot c o. But you're not going to find much. But don't but you should sign up for the email list sign up instead. For, <laughs> don't sign follow up for the email her. list, and again, you can find all of that stuff at um, Halen.co. Halen.co. My website. You can, can and like you can find not only one-on-one consultations, but also your incredible sex ed for all resources. There's three different classes, I think, and you have all of your interviews on podcast. 
your like print stuff. You did the research. And yeah, I did. I am a professional interviewer. Kaylin does oh, not fuck around. I am with an research. entertainer. Oh um, but and also like you have a show yes. on Cosmopolitan's yes. YouTube. Yeah. And it's really fucking cool. I watched a few episodes Thank last you. night. I had to sign in because they have to make sure that you're 18 or older. Mm. It's because the show is basically I walk around New York City yeah. with my pockets full of sex toys. It's and really fun, people though. to talk to me about no. them. And like, okay, you are an entertainer. You yes, are really good. She is an it's really fun to watch. I'm a but Leo. I, you know, I love this. I love to entertain. Yes. I love Leo. Yes. yes. Um, but like, there is an infinite, like, well, not infinite. I don't want to say that because we all have our limits, but there is an incredible, abundant, well, full of information like on I your said, website. I've been doing this since I was yes. 15 years old. So there's so many great ways to like work with you and receive from you. So mm-hmm. go check it out, yeah. Halen.co. And Halen and I will be doing a fun little t-shirt collab. Hello. Yeah. That may or may not be up by the time this airs. Yeah, so later this summer. Hopefully. Yeah. Check yeah. co and uh, see if it's there. I would say I think bare minimum we can have, you know, a pre-sale page. We'll have something going out. on. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. We will time um, this. So uh, yeah, check that out. Yeah. Amazing. Do we have any other housekeeping to announce? I guess we can No, have done I, the think, beginning. I that's think I think that's it. You might well, be able to buy my deck by the time this is right, out. You, just so you, you know. will be able to buy Caitlin's deck. Offerings Oracle will probably be here available for purchase. It's really cool. Yeah. I got a sneak peek and it's gorgeous. Motherofmystics.com. Support us. Yeah. We're great. Should we maybe record a little bit of card polls for our Patreon? Before After we go, this. ooh yeah! So well, maybe we're gonna if you're go a patron. do that. Okay, so we'll, we'll have a little extra for our patrons. Check ooh, that out: well, Patreon.com/slash Third Eye Bind. And thank you for listening. Thank to Third you. Eye Bind. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys. Yes. Yes. Me. Be sure to leave us a message on the Third Eye Line. Third Eye Line. Bye. Bye. See you next week. Hello. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow the podcast at Third Eye Bind Pod on Instagram. There, submit your questions via the Third Eye line by sending us a voice message or text DM. The show is available wherever you listen to podcasts and for you to watch on YouTube. Get early access to episodes and even monthly one on one sessions with us by joining our Patreon. Find us at patreon.com slash third eye bind. Third Eye Bind is produced and edited by Mike Realm, hosted by Caitlin Grania and Laura Wong. Music by Mike Realm. Set design by Laura Wong. You can find Laura on Instagram at Lady Moon Co. And you can find Caitlin at caitlin.grania.